This is WPSL Fort St. Lucie, the talk of the Treasure Coast. The opinions on this program are those of the program host and guest and not necessarily those of WPSL. WPSL does not endorse products that may be mentioned. Any reproduction or retransmission of this broadcast is strictly prohibited without written consent of WPSL. Legal questions? Ask a lawyer. Give us a call at 340-1590. 340-1590 here at the studios of WPSL. And Ask a Lawyer with your host, Attorney Stuart M. Address. Good morning. This is Stuart Address for Ask a Lawyer. It is April 1st, 2022. Greg, welcome back. I understand you've been away lollygagging watching tons of basketball games. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine getting paid and watching a national championship game? I, I don't know. Can you get me a gig like that? No, I, you know, it, I have, um, I was talking to Joe Zagaki. Of course, the University of Miami had a good run. Uh, they didn't quite make that, but uh, it was close. And, and he was saying, he said, man, uh, the final four is something I always aspired to see as a fan in person or as a reporter in person. But he said, I can't even imagine calling play by play. <laughs> it, and it is, it, it's a whole different feeling when you're courtside and, and it is a huge event and uh, yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And of course, IRSC back-to-back -back national tournaments and well, what can you say? The uh, Pioneer Swim Team has done that for 45 straight years, for goodness Isn't that sake. incredible? It is incredible. And, uh, of course, the ladies have uh, done it for 44 straight years. And the only reason that they're not up there at 48 is because the women weren't competing for the first few years. Wow. So, yeah. Uh, has there ever been a run like that in any, in any college sport? You know, we, we, it's funny you ask that because we were looking that up and I actually asked the uh, um, head of the NJCA. I said, are there any records? He said, nothing that we can see. He said, there wow. are several teams that have made it to the national championships in basketball 20 or 30 times. But he said, nothing close to IRSC swim numbers. That's amazing. It is amazing. It really is. Well, today is April 1st, uh, traditional day for April Fool's jokes. I have no idea what my son has planned for me, but I do have a warning to you employees out there. Be very careful. You don't want to do something that's going to get you fired. There is a um, very well-known uh, in legal circles um, memo that an employee once sent out. And the memo he sent out by email to his boss uh, basically uh, said, please see attached my letter of resignation. Now, if you open the attachment, the first page of the letter was, you know, please be advised, I am resigning my position, you know, effective two weeks from today. I will certainly do everything I can to assist in an orderly transition, you know, blah, 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 blah. On the second page, it said, April Fools, please don't fire me. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't that the boss had a bad sense of humor. It was that the boss never opened the attachment. He saw the emails that say, please see attached my letter of resignation. And he forwarded it to the appropriate people. And this employee was now gone. Goodbye. Had a nice run. Couldn't understand why they were being let go. Wow. <laughs> Very dangerous. April Fool's jokes, as we get older, can have ramifications. Indeed, there are April Fool's jokes that have led to lawsuits. Yeah, I'm not surprised about that either. You know, imagine an April Fool's joke that goes wrong and causes an injury to somebody even if it's just pulling their chair out or what have you, um, you're going to be sued. Uh, theoretically, you could even be criminally liable. Boy, I'm glad uh, very few people were watching when we started ESPN because <laughs> there was all sorts of shenanigans like that. 
I, I, I can imagine. And uh, just a, a quick April Fool's Day word to the wise. Be careful with your April Fool's jokes. What you may think is funny and amusing, somebody else may think is a good reason for a lawsuit. So if you're gonna do an April Fool's joke, ask a lawyer first. By the way, you know, uh, before we really dig in, yeah, uh, we had a garage sale, a yard sale here last weekend, um, which we announced, Cliff announced on a, a swap shop. And I, when I called in last uh, Friday, uh, you know, I said, hey, come on by, um, you know, uh, buy a trinket and ask a lawyer. Well, we had a, a very good yard sale, but I don't think I brought anybody in because nobody came by and said, hey, I want to ask a lawyer. Come on, folks, next yard sale. You've got to show up for me. You know, I even have a little booth. It'll say five cents. Ask a lawyer. Just like, you know, in the Charlie Brown stuff. I'll even give you lemonade. I need my fans to show up. Wait a minute. That's bribery. No, it is a, a kindly. It's marketing. Southern, southernly <laughs> offer of hospitality. <laughs> in, the hot, in the hot, florid, humid sun. There you go. Oh, I got to ask you, speaking of sun, how did Aaron do down at Nova? Aaron did very well at Nova. Nova, um, I was very impressed with that university. Isn't it uh, a nice campus? It's a beautiful campus. Everybody was so friendly. In fact, we were the first group that they had, had in person for two years. They were so thrilled to have prospective students and families there alive. They, 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 they couldn't get over themselves, you know, that, that you were able to do this again uh, for real. And they, they put on a wonderful weekend uh, for parents and students. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Nova as a private university is a very expensive place to go. As are most private universities, and you know, unless uh, you know the big scholarship comes through, uh, which is you know the odds are against anybody, um, he won't be going there. But you know, he's got some other options, and uh, we're hoping not to hear from um, a certain school today. It's amazing that you have to hope not to hear from them because they have it set up that. If you did not get the presidential scholarship uh, at their university, you will get an email today. If you did get it, you won't hear from them today because they're sending out uh, a very significant award package. So you gotta hope not to hear from them today to, to hopefully get in a few days something from them that offers you like a $50,000, you know, scholarship and all sorts of perks. I hate to say it, but I, I think I uh, might be a little skeptical if anything comes on, <laughs> on today. <laughs> from, <laughs> I think I would be if it said you got something. Yes. You know, maybe that's why they're only, they're only announcing it to people if they didn't get it. Uh, otherwise, you have to wait. So it's a stress, stressful, you know, um, not only waiting to get admissions or denials or be placed on hold or the wait list, but then finding out about scholarships and financial aid. Uh, I don't remember the process being like this when, when I was of age, but then again, so many things have changed. And school is so expensive now. Yeah, but did, did you happen to catch NBC Nightly News last night? They had this interesting story on the Ivy League schools and that um, they're going to open up their registration just a hair, not all that much, but, you know, they have made it so difficult to get in um, that now they're looking for students. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, there have been a lot of applications this year because a lot of stuff was put on hold again, because of the pandemic. And, uh, you know, people are sort of trying to return uh, back to life, although uh, I think, you know, Governor DeSantis' perspective is 
we returned back to life 18 months ago. But, you know, that's his perspective. Well, it, ironically, uh, they had some figures on the state of Florida and the students here have done a lot better than, say, some of the students in the state of Washington, for instance, that couldn't go to school for almost two years. Well, I would imagine that might have something to do with our sunlight and their rain. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's always raining there, so it's yes, yeah, so that's right. All right, so you know, um, let's talk about our dear former leader, President Trump. The other day, filed another lawsuit. He sued somebody you wouldn't expect in 2022. He sued Hillary Clinton. Hey, let's reprise that old song. He sued Hillary Clinton for alleging in 2016 that he was colluding with the Russians. And he's asking for $72 million. And he filed his lawsuit in the Southern District of Florida. Now, I don't know. The suit is six years since the alleged activity where he won the election. So what harm did he suffer? Um, it's also three years since the Mueller report, uh, which found that Trump and the Trump campaign was open to information from Russia. And although, you know, there are many judge, district court judges in the Southern District of Florida who have been appointed by him or Republican presidents, I have the feeling he's not going to find very much receptivity in the Southern District here. What's a statute of limitations, though? I mean, <laughs> isn't that passed already? Well, here's what he's alleged. It's passed for something like defamation. But he's alleging, get this, folks. I've done some of these cases. He's alleging that Clinton and her campaign, along with the Democratic National Committee, or engaged in a racketeering enterprise to collude and um, lie about the election uh, in an effort to defeat him. Now, number one, I've done some racketeering suits. Uh, <laughs> what, what creativity to try to turn this into a RICO action. I can't wait for his lawyers to have to complete the mandatory RICO um, statement. It is going to be very carefully scrutinized by a judge before this lawsuit continues anywhere. Isn't a RICO thing like several pages long? It is many pages long because lawyers like me started using RICO civilly um, as a, a weapon. And so they got into this process of carefully screening RICO cases before defendants even had to respond to the complaint. Uh, you had to show good cause to the court for a basis, possible basis for a, a RICO case. Now, you know, I've done a few. Um, they've all been legitimate. And they are monsters. But... It just seems he, he's claiming that they tried to engage in a fraud to, to steal the election from him. That's 2016. I think I heard something like that in 2020. I mean, it's the same old song, different election. So if he can't, if he can't convince judges in 2020, like over 130 times um, where he lost the election, what luck is he going to have where he won the election? Uh, I just think that um, Sir Donald is uh, looking to distract people from a lot of other news going on in his orbit these days about the real details um, that are coming out regarding his efforts to um, overturn the election, um, regarding what happened on January 6th, and the amazing miracle 
seven and a half hours. Now, folks, if you thought 18 and a half missing minutes on tape during Watergate was a big deal, and it was, seven and a half hours are missing on the White House call log on January 6th. Right during the uprising and the attack on the Capitol and afterwards, seven and a half hours are missing. And here comes a piece of paper with a question, and we'll see if it's a question or a <laughs> attack. All right, uh, let's see, line one. Charlie, you're on, go. Hey, Charlie, how you doing? So um, I'm not gonna argue the point on uh, Mr. Trump, I think he should stop talking about past elections, but Hillary Clinton has never stopped talking about her presidential run and how it was, quote, you could win, but it would still get stolen from you. What say you, Stuart? Well, I, I don't really, I haven't heard anything from her or her camp of recent vintage. Really? And um, I don't know how she could say well, the election was stolen because there, there's been no evidence that 20, 2016 was stolen. It was just a, a very unexpected result. I think everybody thought that Hillary was going to win, including Donald Trump. But I haven't really heard much about you know, Trump stealing the election. I mean, he wasn't even in power. He's been very difficult. Well, I'm kind of missing a lot of what you're saying because of our connection, but Hillary Clinton literally has never stopped talking about the fact that the 2016 election was stolen from her. And I don't think it was. Well, I don't know if she really means stolen literally or stolen in the sense that she should have won. Um, I would disagree if she was arguing it was legally stolen. Uh, the way Trump has argued it. Um, I, I would say it was not stolen, but a very unexpected, surprising result um, that was shocking to the system. Because even, even, even Trump did not really believe that night he was going to win. Listening to your, your show. Thank you. And hello, Greg. Okay, take care. <laughs> take care, thank you. Um, so, you know, I just think that there's a lot of distraction there. And uh, with seven and a half hours of missing call logs, uh, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. And well, just... you know, now that Rico, whole Rico thing is kind of cool, actually, because Joe Biden could sue Donald Trump for that. I guess so. I don't think that will happen. <laughs> But I, I guess he could. You know, I, okay, we're going to get off Trump. Uh, let, me, let me tell you, we've talked about this a few times, but, and, and particularly, I guess, in today's day, day and age, where people have very extreme opinions, and it's so very difficult to move one person from one opinion to a different opinion. A persuasion is virtually impossible, I think, because most people are talking at the top of their lungs. Um, and life has become very polarizing. Uh, God forbid you say the wrong thing at, at a fuel pump or in the grocery store or in a restaurant. You never know what's going to happen, whether there's going to be violence or not. So I, I want to I go into a, a, a very famous case where lawyers now routinely talk to jurors and are successful in moving them off of a previously established, firmly held belief. And it happens almost, I, I would say every day in some court or another in, in, in the country. Um, you know, we lawyers, before we have a trial, have a process called a voir dire or if you're in the South, bar dire. But uh, that is the process of where we ask questions of prospective jurors to try to root out 
um, any beliefs that might be antagonistic to our client and give the other side an advantage. Uh, we also try to find people who may be receptive to our own client and keep them in the witness box as jurors. And one of the other things we do generally in trying to find people who will be fair um, is we try to determine how receptive somebody is to changing their opinion when they get new information or do they just stick to that, that previously announced opinion? You know, some people will stick to it out of embarrassment. Um, some people will stick to it because they won't process the new information. So when I talk about a case, you've all heard of. But the question is, do you really know what happened? And that's the McDonald's hot coffee case. And then we might be able to go into another. What I think most people know is there was a woman who was 79 years old. She was wearing sweatpants, um, went through the drive through window with her grandson to get a cup of coffee. Uh, the grandson stopped so she can place the cup between her legs so that she can use both hands to get the lid off and put in cream and sugar. The cup spills and she gets third degree burns over 6% of her body. And third degree burns are the type where all layers of the skin are burned completely through. It doesn't heal without skin grafting. It's extremely painful and disability results. So that is what most people know. Most people also know that there was a more than a hundred million dollar verdict uh, in her favor for pain and suffering. And the McDonald's hot coffee case is typically used to argue runaway juries, exorbitant verdicts, um, you know, trial lawyers who have run amok and taken off control of the system. Uh, it, it's all very, very negative. But, you know, why should she get $100 million for some burns? All right. You know, I, I can understand that perspective, um, you know, even though she got third degree burns over 6% of her body. But what don't you know? Well, I'll tell you what the jury in that case heard that you may not know. And this is what lawyers do during voir dire. We'll say, well, if you knew X, would that change your opinion? If you knew Y, would that change your opinion? If you also knew Z, would that change your opinion? And before we can talk about whether your opinion is going to be changed, we've had Richard on line one. Hello, Richard. Go ahead, Richard. Uh, good morning. Um, I recently had a situation where, uh, hello? Yeah, hi, Richard. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I recently had a situation where I won't. Richard, your phone is breaking up real bad. Okay, if you might listen to a different location here. Is that better? A uh, little bit, yeah. You must be on a cordless phone then, right? Yes, I am. Okay. Greg, are there any corded phones left? Yeah, that's a good question, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's go very ahead, Richard. Let's try. Okay. Uh, again, my wife and I had a contract that come to our house, a couple of them. We got estimates, and uh, I'm not going to mention any names or whatever, but uh, the one guy that we chose said he would do the work, and any referrals that we gave him where people contracted with him, he would give us a $100 interest Now, I didn't okay. solicit this from him. He offered it. And I have two witnesses that heard him say that. Now, I had gotten two jobs, you know, friends of mine came over to see the work and contracted with him. And he's just not responding. Now, it's a verbal contract. And I have two witnesses. Is he liable, responsible for that? That is a really good question. Um, for those who may be on Facebook, um, Richard is saying that a contractor offered him $100 incentives for referrals um, to him. 
and he referred two people to him. Uh, there were two witnesses to the, to the verbal statement and the contractor won't pay him. Uh, is it enforceable? Yes, it is. Oral contracts are just as enforceable as written ones, just a little bit more difficult because you don't have a writing. Uh, with two witnesses, I would say that you have a pretty good prospect of prevailing um, in a small claim suit. Uh, and that's really, you know, it's very exactly. simple. What was that? Exactly what I thought, because I am a retired contractor in the state of Florida. And anytime I offered that, I came through with it. And all it did was get me more work. Exactly. And, and I, I think you would likely prevail, um, you know, in a small claims lawsuit with those witnesses coming in on your behalf. Would that be something that I, I should uh, uh, get a lawyer for, or should I just go to small claims court and do it? Well, given that, given the amount involved, I would recommend you do it yourself. A small claims court is very friendly and receptive um, to the average person. Right. And as long as you go in prepared, you know, with your bullet points and with, you know, um, the witnesses, you know, I, I think that you can handle it just fine on your own. Very good. All right. Thank you for calling. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Take care. Hey, Stuart, how formal is small claims court? A small claims court is as, as formal as you can get. You can't wear shorts. You can't wear flip flops, but you can. You don't have to come in, gentlemen in a, in a suit and tie, and ladies in a, in a dress. You can you can come in in jeans. You know, don't come in with a T-shirt that says, uh, you know, F Biden or F Trump or you know, don't come in with any of those crazy T-shirts. It would be nice if you could have um, a regular button-down shirt. But that's not even required, okay? When you get there, um, the first thing that happens in any small claims court case is they send you one by one into a room where a lawyer who's volunteered his time will try to mediate the dispute between you and whomever. And if you can come to an agreement, they'll announce the settlement in court. Um, and hopefully the other party will follow through. If not, you come back. Now, if you don't reach an agreement in that room with the attorney, you go back into the courtroom, you uh, tell the judge that we did not reach an agreement, and the judge sends you away and lets you know that you'll get another letter in the mail giving you a court date. So you really have to go two times. Once is for mediation, and if that doesn't work, then you come back another day for trial. You'll have a couple of weeks notice. So you'll be able to prepare your materials or whatever you, do, you want to say. And most small claims cases, you know, the trials take about 15 minutes. And most of them are not complicated. Um, most of them are just, well, this is what I feel and this is the documents I have and here's a receipt. Uh, here's where he may give me a warranty or something. And then, okay, well, let me hear from the other side. Okay. Well, based upon this and this and this, it seems that you, whomever you is, are, is correct and I rule as follows. It, it's, it's that simple. Now, there are some small claims court cases, since it is up to $8,000, that are more complicated, but not so complicated that you have to have an attorney. Although when you get up near the limit of the $8,000, uh, sometimes people will come in with attorneys. Uh, if you're going to use an attorney, I would recommend that you uh, call the, the Bar Association in the county and ask for referrals of attorneys who handle small claims court because you want an attorney who is always in small claims court, unlike me, okay? Uh, an attorney who's always in small claims court will show up on a small claims court date and he may be representing a dozen clients. So he can price out his fees accordingly. If I go into small claims court, I'm going in for one person. You're paying the full weight of my fee. And trust me, that's not gonna be cost effective for you. 
But if he's there for you know 10 people, it's much more cost effective. He will charge much less and be much more familiar with the process. So it is informal. Well, using Richard as an example, would his witnesses have to be at that mediation thing too? Um, no, they would not actually have to come to the mediation. And knowing that the first day is mediation is helpful so that you don't drag them there. Because what you can say to the attorney is, I have two witnesses. You may even have them write out a statement, which would never be admitted in court. But for the attorney who's trying to mediate the case to look at, might be very helpful. Uh, but you would absolutely have to have them uh, for any trial uh, because an affidavit or anything else like that is not going to be admitted. Because even with the very relaxed rules that exist in small claims court, um, the court still will not accept hearsay. And an out of court statement offered to prove the truth of the statement is hearsay unless it falls within one of 27 exceptions. And I guarantee as the average layman is not familiar with all the exceptions to the hearsay rule. Wow, 27 exceptions? Yes. Okay. <laughs> like, like, like for example, a dying declaration. Somebody is moments away from death. PD did it. That can be admitted in a court in a trial against PD as an out of court statement, even though it's for the truth of the matter asserted, and even though the person who said it is not available to be cross examined. The whole purpose of the hearsay rule is to pr provide cross examination opportunity as part of our fundamental fairness you know, in, our, in our system. But one of the exceptions of dying declaration. Part of our system is the belief, whether it's correct or not, but the belief that when you are on the verge of death, you have no motive to lie. And so that whatever you say is, is most likely true. And so a dying declaration is admitted as an exception to the hearsay rule. So too is an excited utterance. Now, something really amazing has happened. Maybe it's a car accident. Um, maybe uh, it's a robbery or a shooting. And within moments, you're giving a statement to the police. Literally, I mean moments, not hours, not even a lot of minutes, within moments. And the police can tell that you are at a high state of excitement. Um, agitated or upset and that the incident that you're talking about has just occurred the, the the law perceives that as an excited utterance where you have not had sufficient time to concoct some story and so that what comes out of your mouth as an excited utterance is highly reliable and so if you're not available to testify and let's say the police officer who heard you say whatever you said goes in and says, well, you know, John Doe told me, objection, hearsay. Then the judge looks at the other attorney and the attorney says, exception, excited utterance. Overruled, you may answer the question. That's how it works. So there'll be an objection and the judge asks the other attorney, well, is there an exception? You announce the exception, judge rules, and in that situation, the officer would be allowed to give the testimony of what was said to him. But that's just two examples of the complexities of the hearsay rule. Trust me, in law school, there are classes just on the hearsay rule. Uh, it's one of those rules of evidence that is a monster. And really, no attorney ever knows at all it is a constant career of, of learning um, and getting new information. And there, there's just no possible way. You, you can memorize all 27 exceptions, but there's no possible way to instinctively know when a statement is made, whether your exception applies with some of the smaller ones. The big ones, everybody knows. 
So that's how that would work. Uh, in general, yes, you need the witnesses for any trial uh, because the other side has to have the opportunity to cross-examine them. That's part of our system of, of fairness. So, all right, what else did that McDonald jury hear? Well, they heard that since 1978, McDonald's brewed its coffee at between 195 and 205 degrees and kept it for sale at 180 to 190 degrees. The jury heard that most other coffee companies sold coffee at about 160 degrees. At that point, 160, it would take 20 seconds for third degree burns if there was a spill. At 180 to 190, it takes about three seconds. So if you spill it at that temperature, you're gonna get seriously burned. All right, so now you're in war gear. The attorney says, all right, for those of you who raised your hand, when I asked if you thought the McDonald's jury, uh, the verdict was excessive. If you now had this information, would any of you perhaps reconsider? And maybe no hands go down yet. So the, the lawyer who's doing war gear would go, okay, here's some more information the jury had. Coffee is unsafe at 180 to 190 degrees. It will cause burns to the throat if, fall, if swallowed within the first few minutes. Severe burns can even be caused at 130 degrees. So now we're getting more evidence. The coffee served at McDonald's temperatures, as I said, causes third degree burns in about three seconds. So now you go back to these Lardier and let's say the group of people who held up their hands and thought that McDonald's verdict was excessive. Well, with this additional information, would you perhaps reconsider? Maybe, maybe a hand goes down. Um, you're probably gonna have a majority of the panel who have raised their hands to do, do they think McDonald's jury was excessive? Okay. So you're trying to see now, what is it gonna take for people to perhaps reconsider? So then you go, okay, it turns out between 1982 and 1992, McDonald's had 700 prior complaints regarding burns. And despite them did nothing to change its brewing, holding or selling temperatures. Any of you changing your mind yet? All right, well, let's try this. Between 1982 and 1992, others who have been burned included burns to their genital area, like the 78-year-old woman who put it between her legs, including sugar and milk. It was not the first time it happened. Uh, in fact, um, McDonald's had knowledge of these complaints um, for 10 years. So, anybody changing their mind yet? All right, we continue on. During the trial, McDonald's admitted these prior complaints and further admitted that it had taken no action to reduce temperatures and testified that it didn't plan on reducing temperatures. Anybody getting a little bit peeved at McDonald's right now? Wow, that's bold. <laughs> yeah. I mean, anybody, you know, if you're sitting on a jury, are you beginning to get a little bit irritated with McDonald's position on coffee? Well, right at the very beginning, I would say the whole thing is a joke. But now that you've elaborated on the circumstances going all the way back 10 years, that changes the whole story. And it I've does. never even heard that. It does, and there's more. Yes, there's more. It referred, McDonald's during testimony of its corporate people referred to the 700 reported cases of burns as statistically trivial. So all those people have been burned, it's trivial. McDonald's also admitted that people over age 65 are at an increased risk of coffee spills and are probably unaware that they could get third degree burns from a spill of their coffee. Let's 
keeps on going. Uh, one McDonald's corporate employee testified the coffee sold at that temperature is not fit for human consumption. All right, panel of our dear people. Anybody else beginning to think that perhaps that verdict may not have been excessive and that there were reasons for it? Any of you out there maybe beginning to change your mind? Now, experts testified that most stores sell the coffee at 150 to 165 degrees. Um, the jury found McDonald's 80% at fault. Even with all that, McDonald's was not 100% at fault. McDonald's was 80% at fault. So whatever verdict it was going to give, it didn't know, but it was going to be reduced by 20%. They awarded compensatory damages of $200,000. You hear that, folks? $200,000, not millions. What they awarded in punitive damages was $2.7 million. Now, let me give a quick explanation here. Punitive damages are not intended to compensate the plaintiff. The plaintiff gets the money, but they're not intended as compensation. It's intended as punishment for the other party who engaged in the wrongful conduct. It's designed to make that party think twice about continuing this practice and cause it to modify its behavior. So in that context, is $2.7 million excessive? Well, If you say it's excessive, let me ask you this. Would you still say it's excessive if you learned that it represented only two days of coffee sales in the United States for McDonald's? I mean, it's a punishment, but is it really a punishment? Not 2% of their earnings in the US, 2% of coffee sales for two days, two days. Wow. <laughs> so in that context of trying to punish McDonald's, is the $2.7 million awarded to the plaintiff really that unreasonable? And this is what we would ask again on a board year panel and see if people are beginning to change their mind. Now, the judge referred to McDonald's conduct as reckless, callous, and willful. Um, by the way, given the plaintiff's 20% at fault, the compensatory damages were reduced to 160,000 and punitive damages were reduced, not by 20%, because that 20% applies to compensatory. A judge has a lot of leeway in what it adds to punitive or takes away. This judge, um, reduced punitive damages from 2.7 million to $385,000. $385,000. How much were her medical bills? I do not know. So that is a total of $545,000. But she didn't even get that. In order to avoid McDonald's threats of an appeal. Oh, I'm sorry. The judge ultimately reduced that total of 480,000. Uh, and then to avoid the threats of an appeal, they, she got a little bit more than that. She got $600,000. Now, at this point, I'm looking at the jury panel and I'm looking to see really how many people put their hands down because they're the ones I want on my jury. The ones that are still proclaiming McDonald's is right. I want off the jury one way or another. That's how attorneys are using the McDonald's case and jury selection. 
Now, I'm going to give you one more fact on the McDonald's case. One more fact. In terms of how much the plaintiff received, would you say it's unreasonable if you learned that this 79 year old grandmother's labia were melted together? The women listeners out there just think of that. Wow. <laughs> the men just the men just instinctively put your hand in front of your groin. Uh, yeah. Um, so now imagine the pain and ask yourself whether 600,000 is too much. So that's a McDonald's coffee case. Um, what people understand is not really the whole story. And what people hear of any case is never the whole story. Unless you have sat and watched the trial every day, let's say if it's on TV, nonstop, you don't know what the jury heard. You don't know everything the jury heard. What you know is what you read in the paper, what you saw on TV in a, a two minute snippet. Um, you have the basics, but you never have the information that the jury has and on which it bases its decision, usually after many hours of deliberation. Now, I'm not saying all jury verdicts are correct. Uh, I've had a few of my own that I thought were very, very incorrect um, and very unfair. Uh, but, you know, our system, which is imperfect, was established in a way to try to make it as fair as possible. And, you know, I've had clients who lost a hearing or, or lost a trial and where I was surprised that the jury went the other way. And where I'm expecting when we get out of the courtroom, the clients would start yelling at me. And in fact, that's not what happens. Very often my clients, uh, you know, we'll, we'll say, thank you. I said, what are you thanking me for? You know, I mean, I, I didn't get you what we set out to get you. And the answer is always the same. Really, it is. And for other attorneys, friends of mine, it's always the same. It's at least I had an opportunity to be heard. And that's what people really want. They want an opportunity to be heard to have their feelings, their opinions considered and, and fairly evaluated. And I dare say that if we would do that in, in ordinary life, um, we might not be as polarized as we are right now. You know, if somebody who had a different opinion, uh, a different political opinion, you know, was at least heard. And if they in turn would hear your perspective, maybe neither of you would change each other's minds, but at least you've exchanged ideas. And that's really what the whole First Amendment was all about, the exchange of ideas. Uh, not necessarily the persuasion of the convincing. I don't know. I, I think we are, before we go into another topic, I'm just going to talk a little bit about this in general. I, I think we are at a very critical tipping point in our nation's history where there are two paths in front of us. And as I have often said to my son, there are decisions in life. You can go down one path, and if you turn it, decide it's wrong, you can come on back. But there are decisions where you travel down a path and you can never come back. And we are, I think, at a tipping point between democracy and autocracy. And if we choose autocracy because it's something different, maybe it'll work better. 
We may never come back to democracy. And, you know, American democracy is different than other democracies in the Western world. Uh, it is very different. It, even back in the late 1700s, you know, when we started this, uh, you know, various French philosophers called it the grand American experiment. Because it was so unusual. And although I suspect nobody will, because you're not in college, if you were to go back and read the Federalist Papers or read the French philosopher Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, his book, Democracy in America, from his perspective as a Frenchman, uh, his perspective of this new uh, American democracy, this new constitution that they've established. Uh, it's fascinating that even back in the late 1700s, the world looked at us as a fascinating experiment. Would it succeed? Would it fail? Would George Washington become king? Or would he lay down his sword and transfer power peacefully to the next person? That had never been done before. I mean, there have been democracies, but you know, peaceful transfers of power were rare. Um, and you know, George Washington was actually offered the position of king. He was told he could be whatever he wanted to be. And he said, no, we, we fought that type of, uh, of a government led by a, a sovereign. That's what we just fought. I, mean, I don't want to be king. And that's how you know, our constitution has developed where we have a president and we have a Congress and we have a judicial branch and we try to do as best we can. So I guess all I can say in closing is do the best we can and hopefully everybody gets a little bit more, um, more heard. So with that, this is Stuart Address for Ask a Lawyer on April Fool's Day. Be careful. Have a good week and I'll see you next Friday. You've been listening to Ask a Lawyer right here on WPSL, Port St. Lucie, WSTU, Stewart.